Is there anything else you want to add before we hop into the Q&A? No, let's, uh, let's turn it over to you guys. Yes. So why did you decide to start like focusing in longevity? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I guess there's sort of two things, right? The first was when Olivia was born, she's my oldest. Um, and I, I bet all of you can appreciate this. Those of you that have kids, which I'm guessing is, is most of you, um, something about your mortality kind of kicks in. There are many stages to mortality. Um, but I think having a kid is one, I think losing a parent is one, I think losing a friend, like we, you know, as we gain and lose things throughout life, we become aware of its finitude and her birth was a moment where I was like, huh, this is amazing. I, but you know, uh, I'm not going to be around forever to be a part of her life. So that kind of got me thinking about it. And that coincided with me also kind of coming to the realization that there are lots of things in my family history that, that might otherwise suggest a short life for me. And I wanted to get very serious about it. So my own journey into this space was actually very selfish and was strictly geared towards me figuring out things for myself. Awesome. Okay. I'm going to repeat that question. So there were two questions there. The first was an update on Clotho and I'll explain what that is for everybody else. And then the second was on the gram of protein per pound of body weight. Is it ideal body weight if a person is overweight? I'll start with the second question. Um, the short answer is it depends on how overweight. So if a person came to me and said, look, I weigh 260 pounds, I probably should weigh 200 pounds. I would tell them, you know, if I agreed with that assessment, I'd say being closer to the 200 is probably fine. You don't need to be at the 260. Okay. This gentleman was asking about a podcast I did. So, uh, I don't know how many months ago it was, six, nine months ago, I had a, an amazing scientist on my podcast. Her name was Dina Dubal. She's uh, a neurologist at University of California, San Francisco, and she studies a protein called clotho. This is a protein that is made by the body. It is made uh, in response to exercise, but it also is just made uh, you know, endogenously and declines with age for reasons we don't understand. So uh, children make six times more of this than adults, but of course, any one of us can transiently increase it by exercising. Um, what's special about this protein is it seems to be one of the most protein, one of the most important proteins that protects the brain. And so in both mice and monkeys, when you inject this protein, if these are animals that have signs of dementia or cognitive decline, it reverses. If these are normal animals, they seem to get superpowers, like super cognitive powers. That protein is going to be tested um, over the next three years in humans. And if the results of that look promising, then a larger clinical trial will take place. So I would say the best case scenario here would be that in, you know, seven to 10 years, this could be an actual drug that humans take uh, either to prevent cognitive decline or to treat it. So what is the best type of protein supplement you recommend to get to your gram so you have to hit? So I always ask people if possible, and it's not always possible, whatever you can get from food is great. But I understand that for many people, and again, especially for women, it's really hard to just mash through that much protein. So we turn to supplements. Now, when it comes to foods, the three that stand out the most are dairy products, beef, and eggs. And there's a, cause there's a quantitative way that you measure both the type of amino acid and the, what's called bioavailability of the amino acid. So how complete are the sources of amino acids and how readily can the bodily access them? Can the body access them? So again, if you're thinking about eating beef, eggs, uh, and dairy are the big ones. Again, you can get lots of amino acids and lots of other proteins. I'm not saying don't eat chicken or fish or vegetable proteins, but those are big ones. Therefore, when you're supplementing <clears throat> whey protein, which comes from dairy, tends to be the winner. Now, casein is also great because it's also from dairy. So whey or casein probably stand out a little bit above, but so does egg protein supplement. So what I tell people to do is... Um, figure out what works best for you. Cause there's some people that just can't do dairy proteins. Remember if you, just because you can't tolerate dairy doesn't mean you can't tolerate a dairy protein. Most people who can't tolerate dairy can't tolerate the carbohydrate in the dairy. 
um, but they're totally fine with the protein. So give it a try. So you're saying a few years ago, you did a genetic test and it did not show a genetic. Okay. So let's assume that the, the, that the test was correct. What it was screening for was very likely a gene called the ApoE4 gene. And um, this is a gene, the ApoE gene that exists in three types. There's the number two, the number three, and the number four. Now, every one of us has two copies of every gene because you got one from your mom and one from your dad. So if there's three types of a gene and there are two copies, there's six combinations. We can go through them all. You could be a two-two, you could be a 2-3, you could be a 2-4, you could be a 3-3, three, three, a 3-4, three, or a 4-4. Four, four. Okay, why is that relevant? One of those types is higher risk than the other two, and that's the 4. So people who have two copies of the 4 are at significantly higher risk for Alzheimer's disease, about 10 times higher risk. Now, it doesn't mean that they're guaranteed to get it, but their risk is significantly higher. People who have one copy, typically a three and a four, are at about a two times risk. And so what that study told you was you, what I'm assuming it said was you did not have a copy of the four gene. So you might be a three, three, which by the way, most of you probably are. 60% of the population is a three, three. That's the good news. The bad news is it doesn't mean you're free of risk because the uh, the only people who can't get Alzheimer's disease are people who don't have brains. I mean, I'm being glib. Um, everybody with a brain is at risk. And um, unfortunately, women are at almost twice the risk of men. Now, we don't have a great understanding of why. There are lots of theories. I won't expand on them now for the sake of time. But this is one of the areas where women are disproportionately affected to men. The other one, by the way, being osteoporosis and falls. So we've touched on both of the areas where women are at higher risk. Of course, men have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, so... Yeah, the takeaway for me is I'm a 3-3 three, three as well, but I don't rest on it, right? I, I act as though I'm high risk, meaning I take all the steps possible. Exercising being the single most important thing we can do to preserve brain health, uh, you know, managing nutrition, sleep, all of, all of the things that I can do. Sure. Okay, so the first question was um, talking about how your mom had a fall, she broke her hip, had a long protracted recovery, managed to survive, but was never the same again and basically slipped into uh, a state of cognitive decline. And your question was, is there a relationship there? Very good question. My intuition is that those there is a relationship there. In other words, we we don't know the 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 we don't have the parallel universe experiment where we could see how she would have been had she never had that fall. So what we're trying to understand is is there any causality between the fall and her cognitive decline? And my intuition is that there is. And it's exactly what you said. It's that with the period of profound inactivity and probably with it, not just the physical inactivity, but also I would suspect some cognitive inactivity. If nothing else, it may have sped up by a period of years, something that may have ultimately happened, um, but I think probably was happening sooner than it should have. Um, but again, I don't, I don't, it would be, a, it would be a very difficult thing to prove that, but that's what my, that's what my intuition says. And I, I think that's just yet another reason to, you know, kind of think about all these things we've talked about as far as like, what are the steps we can take to minimize our risk of a fall?